All right. Well, hey, happy Thursday, everybody. Um, dude, this is the end of week two. Think about this. At the end of today, we're a sixth of the way through the class already. Holy crap. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you think about it, we're doing six chapters and we're finishing up chapter two. So yeah, we're right on pace. Uh, anyway, uh, so today we're going to continue to talk about images and we're going to talk, keep talking about images of refraction. And specifically, we're going to talk about lenses. Like, why, how lenses do what they do, see if we can create an equation similar to one that we have for mirrors so that we don't always have to draw the rays and, and do all that kind of stuff. But uh, we'll talk about all of that. And then we'll talk about just like general optics, like what happens when you put lenses together. So we get things like telescopes and, and uh, microscopes, or why does the eye do what it does? And why do certain people like myself need corrective lenses? And why does that then make it so that I can see and focus? And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about all that. Um, we just, we should probably take care of the, what are the equations involved so we can actually do them. Um, but before I dive into that, I want to talk about any kind of questions and stuff that you guys have regarding homeworks or other topics. Um, but I'm going to start, let's start with just any homework questions, any questions from um, the chapter two homework that's due on Tuesday. All right, so it's looking like not, and, and that's totally cool. We can, uh, we'll probably have lots of questions for those on Tuesday. Um, so let's get to other topics and then we'll start, uh, Victor just put one in the chat box here. He said, um, about x-rays. So do x-rays have reflection and refraction, right? Cause we've been talking about the visible spectrum and, um, you know, so the question is, do x-rays do the same thing? And the answer is absolutely, absolutely. X-rays reflect. They also refract. Um, they are going to refract at a different angle than visible light. Like think about when we were talking about dispersion, right? what causes the rainbow and how all the visible colors, um, they actually have slightly different ends. That was because of their wavelength, right? And x-rays have a much smaller wavelength than even visible light. So they're going to um, bend in a different way. They're going to actually slow down a lot more. Um, and so they're, they're going to bend at a, uh, I think they've got a, a much bigger N actually is what it is. And, um, but yes, they will still refract. Um, so that is an issue. You can imagine, think like x-ray technicians and all that have to be concerned with that. Um, but it is just one of the things that we do have to deal with. And reflection, uh, same deal. They will still reflect off of other objects. Um, but suppose like you're going in for an x-ray. I think you broke a bone, you know, so you take your hand and put it on the thing and they shoot x-rays at it. Um, first of all, think about, I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I've, I've had a few x-rays taken in my life. Um, for those of you who have, where do they put the thing that sends out the x-rays, right? The thing that they actually move with their hands and, and they set it. Where is that relative to the part that they're looking at? It's on the other side. Uh, so it's on the, like, the other side of the, the film or whatever, right? So like yeah. Film underneath. And like, if they're going to x-ray my hand, they're going to take that x-ray device, pretend that this bottle is my x-ray device, and they're going to put it so that it's like directly overhead, right? And in fact, sometimes they think about when you get dental x-rays, if you've had dental x-rays, they put that like right there, right on top of it. So think about what those angles are, the angle of incidence. What kind of angle of incidence are you getting? Big or small? Small. Small, very small, right? It's almost perpendicular. So if you have small thetas, <laughs> Victor just put in the chat that you went to the dentist yesterday and started to think about this class. Awesome. That is awesome. I like, you don't know how proud that just made me. I like, I'm, I'm like tearing up a little bit. Oh, 
that's awesome. Um, I, I can't tell you how, like, everywhere I go, I'm always thinking about physics. So anyway, um, but we've got really, really, really small thetas for the angle of incidence. And so because the, those angles are small, the refraction is minimized, right? Think about Snell's law. It's n times the sine of theta. And if theta is small, sine of theta is small. So we don't really get much deviation, right? And in fact, if the angle is zero, if you're perpendicular, there's no refraction whatsoever. So um, that's probably one of the reasons why when they're trying to get really good images with x-rays, they get everything lined up so that it's virtually straight on. So there's minimal refraction and they don't have to worry about any kind of a distortion. Now, the other thing that is useful or, or handy, but it doesn't exactly work out so well with x-rays, but think about this, like if you've got uniform thickness, it doesn't even matter if you like came off at a slightly different angle, everything's offset the same amount, right? We, we talked about that where, you know, when you're going in, you're coming out, you're coming out the same angle, no matter what the thickness is. And so really all that means is if you had a constant thickness, send your x-rays through, your image that you get is going to look perfect. It's just going to be offset. But when the doctor, or radiologist, whoever goes and, and looks at that picture, she's not going to know that there was an offset, right? Whatever. To the doctor, it's irrelevant because the doctor sees that picture and it may have well just been straight on, right? So to her, it doesn't actually matter. Um, but, you know, yeah, they, they do reflect, uh, refract. They also reflect. Um, but I think a lot of surfaces for x-rays, at least where we use them, like on the body and all that, are such that the amount that reflects is pretty small. Like, think about this. When, when we've got light coming in through the window, not all of the sunlight comes through the window. It doesn't. Some of it bounces off, right? And you've seen that. You, Think about when you've looked at a window from the outside and you see the reflection of the sun. So some of it bounces back, but it's not very much compared to how much passes through. And I think with x-rays, it's actually very similar. Like the amount of, um, the, the portion of the energy of the x-rays that are getting sent into your hand to take the x-rays, see if you've broken any bones, I think, the amount that actually reflects off is pretty tiny. It's pretty tiny. But anyway, so I'm guessing, Victor, that, that your question actually stemmed from when you were at the dentist and they took that shot with x-rays and you started thinking about it. But yeah, no, refraction and reflection are still occurring because they do with any wave, not just light, not just electromagnetic. Think about like sound waves. Do sound waves refract? Do they reflect? Well, they for sure do. Yeah, the reflection is clear. That's what an echo is. Anytime you've yelled out, you know, you're, you know, you go to the Grand Canyon and you yell out, and it, well, Grand Canyon is too big. You won't, you're not going to hear your reflection, the reflective voice. But anytime you've yelled out and you hear your voice come back, that's a reflection of the wave. Right, and then the refraction's a little bit harder um, to see because because it's not visual. But they do they they refract they get slowed down. Um, so the same kind of thing. Like if I'm talking and and my sound wave is coming from my voice goes into the lake at an angle, it is going to bend. So. What about hearing a conversation through a wall? Is that like refraction? Uh, that's uh, well okay. Some refraction is going on, um, but the reason that you can still hear that conversation through the wall is that that wave is actually passing through the wall. Think of it as like light going through a window. Yeah, it's changing medium, so that's why I was thinking refraction. Well, so you you know how it gets distorted. Yeah, like you can't necessarily hear it. Like it, you would definitely know that you're not in the same room. Um, 
it, it's more muffled, the tone might change a little bit and all that, right? And that's gonna be due to changes in speed and, and loss of energy. But um, it, it really is the same kind of idea that it passes through. Now, sounds a little bit different because of the fact that it's a physical wave, it's a pressure wave. The sound, so again, I'm talking, I'm making the air move, right? So the air is oscillating. It gets to the wall. The wall is going to vibrate because of me talking. That vibration then transfers through the wall. And now on the back side of the wall, it starts vibrating the air, sends out the sound wave. Right. So you think about the, you know, the kind of the classic in the movies where, you know, someone takes the glass and holds it up to the wall so they can hear a little bit better. Well, what, what's going on there is, is they're just making it so that those sound waves are getting uh, some resonance. Yeah, that's all the stuff we talked about last year, right? You get that resonance in that cup and then it like makes that uh, a more powerful wave and so you can hear it better. But um, is there refraction going on? Sure, but um, it's probably not as big of a deal with sound waves like coming through a wall just because um, the physical nature of it is it's like going to shake the entire wall. Right. It's not localized. Like that's the thing about light. Light is really localized in its effects as opposed to sound um, because light isn't quite as uh, physical as like pressure waves. Anyway, but hey, that was an awesome question, Victor. I love it. Uh, and Bradley, you said you had a question that was related to physics. So let me turn it over to you. So I was outside before, just before class and the sun was out, it's not anymore. But I was looking around and I was thinking to myself, I know we use the ray interpretation of light to do the geometry because it's convenient. Mm -hmm. But if I think about it, like when you turn on a flashlight, the light floods outward, you know? Correct. And I'm assuming that's going to be the same with the, with the sun. And I was just thinking, like, if that's the case, how can you, like, like how many rays of light would there be? Infinite. Generated? It'd be infinite, right? Infinite. Sure. It's, it's going in all directions. And so you can yeah. go in one direction and draw the ray coming out of it. So something like the sun, you know, think, think of it as spherical, even though it's not quite, but eh, close enough, right? So imagine you have a sphere there are going to be rays of light coming out in every conceivable direction. And the same thing like with a flashlight, right? You turn on a flashlight and you've got that opening. The rays are going to be coming out of that opening, but not just straight. They're also going to be coming out at angles. And that's why you get like that conical um, formation of light. Right, it's not cylindrical. It's actually conical because it's allowed to go in all directions. The only reason you don't see light outside that cone is the flashlight itself is blocking it. Right, like again, you think about it, you've got this opening for your flashlight and inside of it is a light bulb. Well, that light bulb is sending out light rays in every direction, but the ray that tries to go this way is getting blocked by the actual flashlight, right? So you got to really think of it as once you get to that opening, then the rays are able to go out and it forms kind of a cone. Um, it's like, because Bradley, I know you're a baseball guy. Think about when you've got, say, in, during batting practice and you got the net there around home. There are lots of balls that get hit that end up don't going anywhere because they get caught by the net right? Because yeah. the direction that they were going to go gets blocked by the net. So think about that as the light rays. Any of those light rays that are heading towards that net are going to get stopped. They're not going to go anywhere. So the light's not going to go out in those directions. And so that just like balls aren't going to go back behind home plate during batting practice. It's exactly the same kind of idea. But 
once they clear that restriction, once they clear that net, if they're on a path that's going to let them go past that net, they're going to keep going. And so the same thing's happening with the light. However, and there is also the, the ray, or sorry, the wave nature of light, which does allow it to bend. Um, we haven't really talked about that yet, about really like the bending of light and, and going around stuff, but um, it's definitely a thing. That's funny that you bring that up because that was my next question. If you have a massive body in space like a star, it's going to bend the space around it. Yep. Does the light bend? Or, does it refract around it or does it bend around it? So, yeah, well, I mean, refracting is bending, right? Mm -hmm. But um, so is it refracting? Is it bending? Yes. Yes, I guess you wouldn't say that it's refracting the way that we define refracting, like how we've defined refraction, because it's not changing medium. It's still in the vacuum of space, but it does bend because space-time bends. And, and that is for sure a real thing. Like for example, um, that's one of the reasons that we've been able to see some exoplanets exoplanets are planets that are not in our solar system. And we know about a ton of them. And there are a lot of ways that they're detected, but one of them is by what's called gravitational lensing. And gravitational lensing is exactly that, that um, let's say that there's a planet out here in space and here we are at Earth. Um, and so there'd be the, the straight line path, but let's say there's a big star somewhere in the middle. So you wouldn't see this because any light that's coming from this planet is gonna get blocked by the star. But because the star is so massive, that ray that's going this direction from the exoplanet gets bent. And then all of a sudden we see it on earth and it's like, whoa, okay. So we're seeing this thing. Um, it's appearing that it's like, again, if this is their orientation, we're gonna see it as if it's up here. Because remember that ray came into earth bent around the sun. But in reality, it's down here because it bent around the sun, the star, or whatever. So um, that's definitely an effect that happens. So, but I wouldn't call it refraction because refraction we kind of reserve that for um, different medium, changing medium. Yeah, got it. Um, but what I was kind of getting at, even is even without the the effects of gravity, like think about this. Um, I don't know how closely you've looked at shadows, right? Uh, again, I, like I told you, I, I can't see the world in a non-physics way. I, I do. Um, I do pay attention to shadows. <laughs> I so, so think about this. When you look at a shadow, the edges of shadows are fuzzy, right? It's not like complete darkness and then light. It's it's really dark over here. It's really bright over here. And then somewhere in the middle, it starts changing. But it's not like there's a line where we say, OK, on one side, it's dark. On the other side, it's light. It's, it's a little bit fuzzy. Um, and that, again, that's actually a good argument for the wave nature of light. Because if you think about waves and, and Huygens' principle that every point, it starts radiating out. Suppose that this is the thing that's creating a shadow. Now we're gonna look at the very, very top. So the light's coming in. And if light were not a wave, you could follow that line down to the ground. And at this point, that would be the edge of darkness. Dark over here, light on this side. And there's no question about it. But because it's a wave, Think about that when it comes in just hits right here. It starts propagating out as a wave, as ripples in a pond. So you start seeing the semicircle or the circular ripples that are coming out. Well, some of that, if, if this is our angle that's coming from the top, some of that light is going to be in here because it propagated out as a wave. And so this part's going to look a little bit less dark than this part. Right, and so you actually do get this gradation 
of light to dark. So shadows are actually a really good example um, or evidence that light isn't just rays, that there is waveness to them. Anyway. So kind of cool stuff, huh? And what I love about it, what I love about especially specifically optics, like optical illusions, um, I think just as a kid, I always thought were kind of fun. You know, like when you go to the carnival and they have the house of mirrors and you go stand in that, that in front of that mirror that makes you look like you're super skinny and like 20 feet tall. And then you go walk down, you know, past the next one and it makes you look like you're two feet tall and, you know, like five times as wide as you are. And, you know, I just always thought stuff like that was really kind of cool. And then once you start learning about it, you can explain it all. You can absolutely explain all of it. And I just, I love that because I'm a puzzler. I like to find the answers. I like to solve the puzzles. And, um, and, and in optics, you don't actually need a lot. Like you think about it, what have we really talked about here? What are the fundamental things we've talked about so far? Reflection and refraction. There's one rule for reflection. Angles come off at the, you know, the light re reflects at the same angle as it came in. And there's one rule for refraction, Snell's law. And with those two, we've already been able to describe and explain tons of stuff. Even that mirror equation, right? Like think about that mirror equation, the one over DO plus one over DI equals two over R. That's only using the law of reflection. Yeah, we take into account the geometry, but other than that, there's one rule that did that. And we're gonna do the same thing with lenses. We're gonna develop an equation for lenses today. And it's gonna come from one thing and one thing only, that law we found for refraction. And so I, I just think that's beautiful that you can have just a very few small set of things and yet you can explain so much. I know I'm also preaching to the choir. I know a lot of you guys are also like super into this and, and can see the beauty. So anyway, all right, any other questions or shall we uh, dive into lenses and what they do? I have one more. Sure, go for it. So a couple of years ago, there was that solar eclipse over the Midwest, well, the total solar eclipse over the Midwest. Yep. Well, I really wanted to see it because I have you know some stuff for it while their mass works too just fyi anyway and i wanted really wanted to see it but i woke up kind of late and i went to my house and i have aspen trees outside of my house and i see seen these shadows a million times from the leaves but they looked like crescent moons yep and i was looking at them and i was like holy shit this is happening right now <laughs> yep I, I, but i don't understand why it would change the shadow of the it's pretty round aspen tree leaves to look like crescent moons. Yeah. So um, that, that's also a very cool thing during eclipses is that um, the shadows change as well. We're going to hold off on that um, until after we talk about diffraction, which is, I think, maybe chapter four. Might be the end of three. I don't remember exactly where things sit. But we'll talk about that later. Um, but yeah, that, that's pretty cool, huh? When you walk out and you see that and you're like, holy crap. Um, another way that you can actually see the eclipse without actually seeing it, um, you can just punch a small hole into a piece of paper, hold it up, and then the same kind of thing, um, the same kind of effect happens. But I actually have another eclipse question. Uh... Okay. During that same eclipse, uh, me and my family actually went to Idaho to uh, watch the, watch it within the region of totality. And uh, during the actual eclipse, when like the, the sun was covered, uh, one of the weirdest things that we noticed was that like there was, you know how like sunsets typically occupy like one half of the horizon, sort of like mm -hmm. the orange bit sort of occupies the half that the sun's around. Um, during the totality, though, there was an entire ring of orange around the horizon. Like it was like a sunset within a, within basically the entire radius of like where we could see. 
what sort of explanation would that have? If that has to be discussed later, I get it, but. So um, that, that's kind of cool. I'll tell you, I didn't notice that. I, I went up to Oregon. I was, I was in Oregon for that. Um, in fact, you know, this picture of me, that one right there, if you look really closely, um, those are solar eclipse glasses. I was at a baseball game in Oregon. They actually started the game at like seven in the morning so they could have an eclipse delay. Um, anyway, so I love that picture because it's like baseball and science nerdiness and I'm drinking a nice cold root beer. So, um, but anyway, so I didn't notice that. I guess I, I didn't, wasn't paying attention to that part. I, I noticed how like the birds started, like they went crazy, weird, you know, like weird sounds, it got colder. Um, and the earth almost, it almost felt like things got still. It was really kind of weird. It was, um, it was transcendent, honestly. The experience yeah. was crazy. Well, it, it's made it so that I, I'm going to go to more of them. I actually was booked. I don't know if I told you this. I, I already had um, a trip planned at Chile to go down in December, this past December, because there was another total eclipse that went across um, South America over like Chile and, and Argentina. Uh, but because of COVID, I wasn't able to go, but I was like, I'm, oh, I was already in. So, um, but good news, there's going to be another one across Mexico and the U.S. in just a couple of years. It won't hit us, but you can go over like anywhere from Texas up to like Michigan. Um, you'll catch it again. But anyway, <laughs> but to get back to Jacob's question, so so you said so you looked all around, like you looked in every direction, and it looked like sunset. Yeah, it was it was Idaho, so it was it was super flat, and we were able to uh -huh. see like the entire horizon, and it was just orange all across it, basically. Like right. it was darker, but then like the edge of the horizon had orange, like it was a sunset. Hmm. Well, I'm I'm gonna have to think about that one, because that one, I've never been asked that question before. Which I mean, think about that, Jacob. I've, I've been teaching physics for over 20 years, and and you've asked me a question I've not had before, so that's, I'm impressed. Um, so I don't know off the top of my head. I'm going to have to think about that. Um, but maybe let's first just talk about like sunsets. Why do sunsets look orange? Why do you think it is that when you look at a sunset, um, even like after the sun is down, right? So you're not actually seeing direct light from the sun, but you're, you're still able to see kind of that orangish yellow, you know, red kind of colors. So why, why do we see sunsets? What do you guys think? Maybe I it's think like it's like due to the angle of incidence, like the fact that the sun's like below the horizon and it's being re that affects the refraction in a way so that just the orange and yellow light is able to like reach us basically. I'm not sure. Yeah, no, and, and that that's actually exactly right. Like you think about when when light comes to us from the sun, you know, it's passing through the atmosphere and it's bouncing around and, and all that kind of stuff. But when it's down low on the horizon, it's coming through lots of atmosphere. And so it is bending and it is refracting. And what we're seeing, the rainbow idea, remember how with the rainbow, you only see the colors that are actually of the rays that are coming towards you. Well, we see the sunset and it looks kind of reddish orangish because those are the colors that are getting bent towards us. The other ones are not reaching us. Right, and we can still see the sun, even though it's behind the horizon. Well, we see the light at least because it's still it's bending, right? So to see what you saw, something similar has to be happening. That all you're getting are um, the the reds and the oranges, and it could just be as simple as. But I, I, I really, I kind of want to think about this still some more, but it could be maybe as simple as here's the light coming from the sun. Here's the moon that gets in the way. So the only thing, only light you're actually going to see even out at the edges are the ones that kind of bend around. And it could be that the only ones that because of the geometry that can still kind of reach that area or the, well, for sure, the closest area, the, the closest region of light is going to be in that reddish region because the reds bend 
Uh, they're the first ones that show up in the bend. Um, so it's probably something along those lines. And then that's also why it looked like a ring because it's circular, right? Like it, yeah, that, that like same bend is gonna happen in every direction. So that's probably why you saw what you saw. Um, but there, there might be a little bit more to it too. I'm not really sure. I don't have a lot of experience with total eclipses. I've only ever seen yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't think. I just so. like talking about them because that's honestly one of the coolest experiences in my life was seeing that in person. That was really neat. Yeah, uh, um, and I'm going to agree with you there. It was, uh, yeah, it was it was wild, and it was worth it. It was worth going up there. Is worth dealing with the traffic. It was worth. Yeah, every bit of it. I just wish it had lasted more than, you know, a minute and 50 seconds. A minute, seconds. yeah. That's <laughs> the worst thing about it is it lasts so, so, it's so quick. And then, and then you're like, is it over? I want to go back to the eclipse already. <laughs> yep. And then there's a huge difference between just partial versus total. Yeah, it's enormous. Like, yeah. seriously. Even when all of a sudden it's only, you know, 99%, it's completely different than 100% obscured. I mean, and, and you know what I'm talking about because you experienced it for the rest of you guys. If you ever get, yeah, it was chance, like a light switch. It was, you don't know. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's, it's incredible. And you do, you wish it could last for, uh, well, way longer than it does because that, that minute and change goes fast. Cool. Good questions about the, the eclipse. And again, man, optics is everywhere. Yeah. All right, well, hey, are you guys ready to learn about lens equations? Good to go. All right, so uh, I'm gonna hop up to the whiteboard and let's do this. Let's see what um, the math says should happen when we actually make a lens, when we go to something that's got two surfaces. So I'll be right back. All right, so last time we talked about what happens when light enters a curved surface, right? And, and we saw that it can get focused. Um, it actually can also diverge. It can, it can go away if it's curved the other way. But when we are looking at a convex lens or a convex surface, we saw that it did converge and we were able to get a nice little formula for it. So let me just remind you what that formula looked like. So we have this surface right here. And then we got some object that's a distance DO. Um, we saw that its image location, call this guy DI, was related to DO by the formula N1 over DO plus N2 over DI was equal to N2 minus N1 over R. And R was just the, the radius of curvature of this thing. So we built this last time. Go back, watch the video, look at your notes, and you'll see exactly why this was what it was from the geometry. Um, just a few things to remind you about the convention, the sign conventions that we had here. Right now with R, it's going to be positive if it's convex and negative, negative if it's concave, which was different than mirrors. Okay, so it was the reverse um, of the deal with mirrors. And then um, the other thing to remember is the DI. Again, with its positive and negative, because this is a little bit different as well. DI is positive if it's on the opposite side, and negative if it's on the same side. So these are completely reversed than with mirrors. 
but think about the reason why. The reason that we had to do this all stems from the plus or minus for images and objects being plus meaning they're real. The light rays do pass through them. Negative meaning they're virtual. The rays do not pass through them, but it just appear to. And there's a little bit difference of the difference when light passes through a surface as opposed to when it reflects off a surface. So it shouldn't throw you too much that they're different. Like it should make sense that they're different, but it's something we have to pay attention to. Um, I'm going to tell you, like, probably 75% of the errors that happen when you're dealing with optics, geometric optics, is a sign error somewhere. You, you forget to make something negative, um, or you're following the rule for mirrors and you're actually dealing with a lens or whatever. So just do, go slow, pay attention, and as long as you're careful, you should be all right. Okay, so this is where we got when we just had the one surface. But now here's what I want to do. Let's look at a thin lens. And a thin lens, unlike what we are doing here, where we're just going from, you know, from uh, one medium into another, just having to be passing through a curve. With the thin lens, now what we're going to have is something like this, where we got two surfaces. So the light, like if you were to follow actual light here, let's take some rays coming from an object. All right, so here's my object. So let's send a couple of rays so we can kind of follow what happens. Um, that's going to hit this new medium, and it's going to bend. If the new medium has a bigger N, it'll bend so that it's closer to perpendicular. But then once it hits air again, it's going to want to bend a second time. And so it's going to do something like this. So that's what's going to happen to, say, this light ray. And if we were to send out a second one, let me send one that's maybe down this direction. Okay, well, again, it's going to bend, and then that's going to bend again. And it's going to do something like that. So just from the geometry, what we're going to see is that because of the second bend, there is going to be a location where, in this case, it's a real image. But this is sort of what's going to happen. We have to take into account that there are two refractions. The one as we enter the lens, and then the other one as we leave the lens. And it doesn't matter how thin these objects are or how thin they are, um, the bends are still going to happen. It's just if that lens is thinner, there's going to be less of a um, offset Right? Like think about when we were just talking about refraction coming through a, a horizontal plate, like that question on the quiz, right? Um, it doesn't matter how thick that thing is that we're going through in terms of what angle comes out. It's just where that ray is going to be located. Right? So um, the thickness of the lens doesn't actually matter. Plus, we're going to assume that they're pretty thin compared to other you know, things like the radii and stuff like that. All right, so the question is, can we figure out some sort of formula that relates the object location and the image location? And, and the answer to that is yes. And the way we're going to do it is really just use this equation that we derived last time. We're just going to do it twice. We're going to do it once for the first surface, and then a second time for the second surface. All right, now before I go too far, though, I do want to talk about the two kinds of lenses that we have. Um, and every lens we're going to classify as one of these types. All right, so you have converging lenses and diverging. And then right here, converging versus diverging lenses. So 
So an example of a converging lens is the one that I just showed you. The light passes through and then ends up coming back together once we're on the other side. So think about what converge means. Converge means come together. And that's what a converging lens is going to do. A diverging lens is going to make it so that light, once it leaves, is going to radiate away from the other rays. All right. So let me, let me just draw a couple of examples here. So for a converging lens, kind of like the one that I've got up there, um, there's going to be this point called the focal point. So here's going to be a converging lens. And every converging lens has a focal point. And the focal point, just like with a mirror, says that as the light goes parallel to the axis, it's going to bend so that it goes through the focal point. And the lens itself is going to have two focal points. There's going to be a focal point on either side. Because if you send the light in one way versus the other, it will mirror itself, right? It, it'll just backtrack itself. So you'll get the same thing. So if you've got an object here, let's say here's an object. What we're going to get from that, if you were to send out a parallel ray, when it goes to the center of the lens, it's going to bend and go through the focus. Let me actually change the color on that because I want the rays to be solid. So here's a ray, comes out, bends through the focus, and does that. Similarly, if there's a ray that goes through the focus, once it hits the lens, it's going to come out parallel. And so the image that we're going to see from this converging lens would be right here. So the one that I just drew with this relationship, um, it's one that's going to invert it. So it's going to have a negative magnification. Um, in terms of its size, I don't know. It actually looks like it's about the same length. So maybe it's got a magnification of negative one. Yeah, I don't know. But um, this is the example of a converging lens, is that these rays are going to bend and go through the focus. Now, if you have a divergent lens, oh, and by the way, every time I draw a convergent lens, it's going to look like this. Even though you can have a shape that's not like this, that's still convergent, this is what I'm always going to draw. OK, if you have a diverging lens, I'm always going to draw them like this. They're going to look like kind of like a hyperbola. The thing that is, it's two um, concave sides. And so here's our diverging lens. Now it's also going to have focal points. Same thing, one on each side. But now what's going to happen if we have some object out here? So. There's our object. If you send in a light ray that's parallel, instead of it bending towards the focus on the other side, it's going to bend away from the focus on the same side. So parallel rays are going to come in and radiate away from each other. They're going to diverge instead of with a converging lens where parallel rays are all going to come in to the focus. All right. And then similarly, if I were to send in a ray towards the other focus, so let me come in towards the other focus. When it hits the lens, it's going to come out parallel. 
So these rays are not coming together. They're actually going away from each other. And so we have to do that same trick where we did before of kind of following them backwards. OK, well, we follow this one backwards towards the focus. We follow, follow this one backwards parallel. And in this case, we would get an image over here. And that would be a virtual image because we found it by backtracking the rays. Right? We had to go backwards from the rays. The rays didn't actually come together. OK, so when we talk about divergent lens, this is what's going on. The rays, once they pass through, are going to uh, diverge from each other. Convergent lenses, the rays are going to come together to a point. All right, so I just needed to throw that out there. So when I start talking about the lens equations and all that, we talk about, oh, we've got a convergent or divergent lens. You know what we're doing. All right, well, let's get back to this thin lens. And let's see if we can create an equation for what's going to happen once everything is said and done. All right, so we're going to break this into two pieces. But before we do that, let's just kind of label everything on here. Um, I'm going to talk about the thickness of the lens. We're going to call that T. All right, so the lens is going to have thickness T. Um, if we think about how we label things before, the distance to the object, again, that's going to be DO. Now, the DI is going to be what we end up with eventually. So this will be our DI. So all of that is exactly what you've seen before. But here's what I'm going to do. Let's look at what happens when we go through the first surface. Okay, so for surface one, if we look at the formula for that, we're going to get one over DO plus one over di, but this isn't going to be the di at the end. So I'm going to call this di prime. The reason I'm calling it di prime is because the book calls it di prime. Okay. But that's going to be where the image would be if there was only the one surface. Okay. And then we know that that's going to equal uh, shoot, it shouldn't be one over. It should be the n, say. It should be n1 plus n2 over the di prime. And that's going to equal n2 minus n1 over r1. So the r1, I'm putting that on there because this is the radius of the first surface. I'm not assuming that they're the same. I'm going to allow them to be whatever they are. But we'll just say that the first one's got a radius. So if you knew the radius of curvature of this thing, and you knew the n for the material that it's made out of, this was the formula that we already built. OK, but uh, check this out. Where is di prime? Well, di prime would be the, where does it appear to be after the initial bend on that surface? Since those are diverging, we got to kind of come backwards. We got to project backwards. All right, so assume that those are aligned. But that's where the image would be after the first surface. So when we talk about di prime, that's that distance. OK, just so you know what I'm talking about when I talk about di prime. di prime would be where it showed up if there had only been the first surface 
and it would look like the dust. Okay, so that surface one, it, it does what it does. So now what about surface two? Well, we're gonna do kind of the same thing here. But first things first, I want you to notice that we're gonna swap the order of the ends. Do you see why? Why am I swapping the orders of the ends here? Well, the medium is in the different order, no? Yeah, exactly. Like you think about it, the first surface, the order was, let, let's just say it's air to glass. The first surface was air to glass. Now we're going from glass to air. So that's why we have to flip them, okay? All right, so then in terms of what's gonna be here, the first one, I'm gonna call it now DO prime, and then DI, and then for the other side, it's gonna be R2. So we've got R2, because that's gonna be the raise of curvature for the other lens, whatever it is. And then I put the little prime on the DO because it's not the original DO. DO prime is now the location of the object for the second surface. But the object for the second surface was the image from the first. So that's why I'm going to put a DO prime. Does it? It's a separate deal. All right, so that's what's going on with surface two. It looks very similar because it should. It's the same formula. It's still a surface. It's just our ends are reversed. We got a different R. We also have a different O and I. All right, but what I want to do is I want to combine these. I, I want to kind of like see what happens when both of these things occur. So let me real quick on the picture, put in a DO prime. That's the only thing on our picture that's not there. And DO prime is gonna be the distance from this orange dot to the second surface. So that's actually gonna be that distance. So di prime and do prime are actually kind of, re they're related to each other, but they're not actually equal. Notice that they're off by the thickness of the lens. But we are gonna use that relationship to make it so that we can get rid of the do prime. Okay, we're just gonna make that, get rid of this thing and make it in terms of di prime. All right, so here's what our formula is going to be then if we want to combine those things. DO prime, it's actually going to equal T minus DI prime. I'm, I'm just waiting for it. Because you should have a problem with what I just wrote. Yeah, I don't like it because initially I was thinking they should be the same. Okay, so already you start thinking they should be the same. Are you, are you okay, though, that they're going to be off by the thickness of the lens? Yes. Okay, so the fact that the T is in there, maybe you can go, okay, yeah, but they're not quite the same. But that's not the issue most people have when I write that up. Why is it a negative image? Why is it minus instead of plus, right? 
Because shouldn't it be? I mean, just look at this picture. Here's DO, is the pink one. DI is the orange, and T is the purple. DO should be T plus DI. But I didn't write it as T plus, I wrote it as T minus. Okay, so now the question is, is, is Bruce just, you know, did he have one too many root beers today? He's made a mistake, he does this kind of thing. But the fact that I'm talking about it this much means no, I didn't make a mistake. Why is it minus instead of plus? Um, perhaps to account for what sign we'll have at the end. Okay. For our image, like whether or not it's it'll show whether or not it's real or virtual all right so let's just kind of stick with that for a second in terms of maybe not the image itself but let's just think real and virtual because real and virtual is that's usually what causes some that does lead to changes in signs all right so ralph you just said you're guessing a di is negative so it cancels each other out well we, we'd like that but we don't want to try to just make things be to make the math better because that invariably will make us give us problems. But let's just think about it. Come back to this orange guy. So in terms of the first surface, is that orange point real or virtual? It's Vir virtual. It's virtual. We had to backtrack the rays to get it. Okay, so what does that mean, the sign of di prime? It's negative. It's negative. So di prime is going to be a negative number because it was virtual. OK, but in terms of surface number two, this one over here, this point would be a considered a real point. We need this distance to be a positive distance. So I have to make this negative into a positive. That's why the subtraction. All right, so we actually have to put here that the DO prime is T minus DI prime because the image from the original was virtual, but it's acting like a real image or sorry, a real object for the second surface. Okay, if your brain hurts a little bit right now, it probably should. This is when you go, yeah, can we take a five minute break so I can go grab a nice ice cold root beer, calm the nerves a bit. All right, it, this is why I was saying 75% think that's a low estimate. Maybe 90% of the issues you're gonna have with these are sign issues. We have to really pay attention to plus and minus when we do these kinds of things. All right, so the DO prime actually has to be T minus DI prime because the first formula is going to give us a negative for this number. But I need my DO prime to be positive. OK, but what we can do now. We can take that and fire that into the DO prime. All right, so here's where we stand then. The first equation is still that same first equation. The second equation, though, is now going to look like N2 over T minus DI prime plus N1 over DI equals N1 minus N2 over R2. All right, so we got rid of the DO prime. Cool. But now we're going to make an assumption. We're going to assume 
but the lens is very thin. So just like we've done like the small angle approximation, we're going to do a thin lens approximation. And this is going to be thin relative to the radii of curvature. Right? So that T is going to be very small compared to the radii. Well, if we assume that the lens is very thin, that means we're going to think that T is approximately zero. And if T is roughly zero, then in this equation, that kind of goes away. All right, so we're here. Now what I'm going to do is let's take this equation from surface number two and let's add it to the equation from surface number one. You remember the good old systems of equation trick. All right, so check out what happens. We're going to get an N1 over D naught or D, D O. So n1 over do. We've got an n2 over di prime plus a negative n2 over di prime. Those go away. Then we add to that n1 over di. And that's going to equal n2 minus n1 over r1 plus n1 minus n2 over r2. OK, so I'm going to do two things. One, I'm going to combine these. I'm going to combine these by factoring out an n2 minus n1. So we get 1 over R1 minus 1 over R2. Similarly, I'm going to factor out the N1 over here. So this went from a plus to a minus because the signs were opposite. And then I'm going to divide by N1. So I get 1 over DO plus 1 over di equals n2 over n1 minus 1, because I just divided the n1 into that. Excuse me. OK, so at this point, you're like, it, this doesn't help <laughs> whatsoever. Because it, I mean, it's pretty, I mean, at least the left hand side is starting to look like what we saw with mirrors. I mean, it's identical to the lumen mirror, but the right hand side looks way different. Right? Well, that's because we can go one more step. Now, this one I'm not going to bother showing you because I think at this point you guys are probably off of that anyway. But you can look at the geometry of the lens, the R1 and the R2. If you were to send in parallel rays and actually just follow those geometrically, what you're going to find is that they do all come to one point and that this bit, this whole right hand side, is actually equal to 1 over the focal length. So this is called the lens maker's equation, by the way, because if you want to create a lens with a given focal length, you have to adjust the radii appropriately, depending on what your n is, according to this formula. 
But once you incorporate that, this equation turns into one over do plus one over di equals one over f. So I'm going to go ahead and put a box around that because that signifies that we're done. But there you go. There's the equation for a lens. And again, this is usually at about the point where you're like, no, that's not the equation for a lens, that's the equation for a mirror. Remember how we saw that for small angles with the mirror, the focal length was half the radius. And so you get this the same exact equation. To me, this is almost magical. That reflection with curved mirrors, as opposed to refraction with closed surface or curved surfaces, leads to exactly the same formula. I think people that is that crazy. See, yeah, I think people that don't see the beauty in physics haven't gone far enough. Because this sort of thing, and talk about like a religious moment, all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, reflection or refraction are the same thing? Kinda. Yeah, it's it's crazy. All right, so. Since that formula is the same, it turns out that the magnification formula is exactly the same. And the only difference, the only thing that we have to worry about here are sign conventions. So we already kind of talked about the sign conventions for um, the DI and stuff like that. But let me just sort of, um, bring back the idea of F's sign convention. Okay, because we already talked about R. Um, R is positive when it's convex now. Actually, let me just, let me put this all back together again. So here are your sign conventions. So sign conventions for lenses. All right, so again, we already saw for di, positive means opposite side, negative means the same side. For r, positive means that it's convex, and negative means that it's concave, so this is reversed than for mirrors. And then with F, that focal length, it's going to be positive if it's convergent. And it's negative if it's divergent. So as long as you follow these sign conventions, you're going to be totally fine. Uh, let me give you the magnification formula here as well. Magnification, again, it was the height of the image over the height of the object, which ends up being the negative distance to the image divided by the negative distance to the object. So. But let me just put that up here so we've got for completeness. So with those formulas, you no longer have to draw the rays. You don't have to worry about your draw, um, you know, your artistic ability. You can just plug them into the formula, you get an answer. So let me show you how this works. Let's do some examples. 
Um, but before I do that, let me just make sure, double check. Any questions at this point? Anything that you're still a little bit unsure about? So when light rays go in through a lens, they refract and depending on whether or not it's convergent or divergent. No, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. I'm just trying to comprehend how it's the same as a mirror. <laughs> I know, right? It, it's crazy. Um, but I think what it really is, think about like a curved surface. If we're going to talk about something that's refracting versus reflecting, it's still kind of like the same process because of the radial symmetry, right? Your radial lines are coming in perpendicular. And, and I think that's really kind of where all this ends up coming to be the same. Um, but it is, it's definitely a little bit magical, mysterious that you get exactly the same formula. But in terms of functionality, I mean, that's awesome. There's only one formula you gotta know. And that's this one. As long as you remember to follow the right sign conventions for the one case versus the other. All right, so let me, let me show you how easy this is. All right, so here's an example. Suppose we have a convergent lens. And so we got a convergent lens with focal length 20 centimeters. An object is placed 15 centimeters in front of it. Where is the image? Is it upright or upside down? And what is the magnification? So is it going to look bigger? Is it going to look smaller? Is it going to look the same or, or same size? So we're going to answer all of these. And I want you to notice that I didn't actually give you a lot of information. All I told you was the focal length of the lens. Well, I guess, and what kind of lens it is. So I gave you the properties of the lens, and then I told you where the object is. All right, well, let's start making a list of what we know. So we have a convergent lens with focal length 20 centimeters. So that tells me that F is going to be plus 20 centimeters. And I'm going to write the pluses and minuses on these things just to help stress that we need to pay attention to that. So I know it's 20 centimeters because that was the focal length. Why is it plus? Why is that positive and not negative? Is, is convergent. So Ralph just put it in the chat box and thanks for it. Because it's convergent, right? I told you it's a converging lens. So that means F is positive. Okay, then I also have my DO. And it's in front of the lens. So I know that it's going to be a positive 15 centimeters. So it's 15 centimeters away but it's in front of the lens, so it's a real object. All right, so there's our information. If I put that into the formula, we get 1 over 15 plus 1 over di equals 1 over 20. 
And if you solve this for di, we get di equals negative 60 centimeters. Okay, so we can answer the first part. So where is the image? Where is negative 60 centimeters? Which side of the lens? All right, good, Ralph. It's the same side, right? Come over here with our convention. Negative means it's on the same side. So the image, is 60 centimeters in front of the lens. The fact that it's negative also tells you that it's virtual. And that's why it's on the same side, because otherwise, the if it was on the other side, the light rays would come together. All right, so there's the answer to the first question. Where is the image? It's 60 centimeters in front of the lens. All right, so is it upright or upside down? And what is the magnification? Well, let's calculate that. The magnification calculation, M is negative DI, so negative 60, negative negative 60 over DO. So DO was 15 centimeters. So negative negative is positive. So we get M equals four. All right, so I guess we actually just answered the, what is the magnification? It's four times as big. So this is gonna look like it's four times as big. All right, and then is it upright or upside down? Ooh, how are we gonna answer that? Do you remember what told us that about reflections? Um, the answer of no is always acceptable. So go ahead, Jacob. The distance between the focal point and the uh, image? Uh, it... <laughs> yes. So that's a bit more complicated. It's actually really easy. Look at this M. What's the sign on it? Oh, it's positive. <laughs> positive magnification, which means same orientation as what we started with. So since this is positive, that means it's upright. So it's 60 centimeters in front of the lens, and I'm going to put here, and upright. So use the fact that your magnification tells you if magnification is negative, that means it's been flipped over. So this is on the, it's got the same orientation. It's just four times as big. All right, well, guess what we're talking about right here? This is a magnifying glass. This is exactly what a magnifying glass does. Think about when you look in a magnifying glass and you're looking at a coin, let's say. Where does it appear that the coin is? Does it appear that it's in front of the lens or behind the lens? Or does it appear that it's on the same side as the coin or the opposite side of the coin? It appears to be on the same side as the coin. It appears to be on the same side. It just appears to be larger. Okay, so this is like a simple magnifying glass does exactly this. 
That's how it works. Now, obviously, the numbers are going to be different depending on what the lens is and what you're looking at and where it is. But in this orientation, this is acting like a magnifying lens. All right, well, let's do this. Let's change where the object location was. I have a quick question. Yeah, go for it. When you look through a refracting telescope, because I have a refracting, I just want to be clear on that. Is the image, because we're zooming in on it, so the, the magnification should be positive, right? These things are far away, now they look closer to us, right? So it should have upright position, but when I, if I wanted to move, like say I see the planet moving and I need to move the telescope, it's inverted. You gotta move the other way. Yeah, and it always screws me up. Why is that? Okay, so it can still look bigger, but be inverted. That would be like if the magnification was negative four. If the magnification was, was let's say, negative four, then it would look four times as big, but inverted. So you can still have things looking larger but be inverted. And I'm going to tell you that telescopes, it's a combination of lenses. So it's not just like a simple um, one lens magnifying glass. And we'll do an example where we have two lenses so you can see how that can play out. We'll build a telescope, I think. I don't remember if my magnification is actually uh, bigger than one or not, in my example. All right, so no big deal, right? Just plug in the numbers and you run it. But let's change this. Instead of being 15 centimeters in front of the lens, let's make it further away. Let's make it so that it's 50. Okay, so I'm going to keep everything else the same. But this time, let's change it so that we're 50 centimeters away. So we're still going to run the numbers the same way. So we'll have 1 over 50 plus 1 over di equals 1 over 20, because the focal length is still the same focal length. So if we solve this for di, We get 33.3. Yep. 33 and a third. Okay, so now where is the image? On the opposite side. Okay, it's on the opposite side. And it's real. The light is actually passing through it. All right, so there's our di. So then if we go and we calculate our magnification, our magnification is going to be negative 33.3 divided by 50. Because again, remember it's image location divided by object location. And this is minus two thirds. So the magnification, it's two thirds as big. So now it actually looks smaller. And it's been flipped over. Okay, so. What's going on here? Now, this is one, if we were looking through the lens, we wouldn't actually see the image. But we could actually project that image onto a screen. And here's what I want you guys to do tomorrow in lab. 
I know Kathy's going to have what she wants to have happen and, and make sure you do that too. But ask her to bring out some convergent lenses. She doesn't already have them. Right? Convergent lenses. And, and these are going to be the ones that are like magnifying glasses. And what I want you to do is first just like play around with it, look at it, and you can see that it acts as a magnifying glass. But then what I want you to do is um, maybe you guys can have the, the shades up on the window there in the chem lab. And I just want you to hold up that lens with one hand and then a piece of blank white paper with your other hand. And basically I want you to do this. So, so here's your, your paper and here's your lens. I want you just to have your lens fixed and I want you to move your paper and I want you to look at the paper and eventually you're gonna find a distance where you get a crystal clear image of the outside projected on your paper. I, I know you might not believe, it, but try it out. And it's, it's pretty damn cool when you finally get it and you go, oh my God, I can see the trees and there's somebody walking outside, I can see them. And, um, I remember as a kid, that's how I am, um, I noticed this fact with my magnifying glass and the television. And so I would actually be watching television on the piece of paper instead of watching it on TV as it's coming through. But now, of course, it's upside down, right? And it's probably going to be a little bit smaller. But this same lens, even though in this orientation magnified images and made it look like it was on the same side, if that object is further away, it inverts it and makes it a real image. Well, if you've got a magnifying glass at home, you can kind of play around with this and you can see. But it's all because of which side of the focal length we're on. The first time we were within the focal distance, the second time we were outside the focal distance, and the focal distance itself if our object's at the focal distance, and you put that into the formula, these two things cancel out and you get one over di equals zero, which means there is no image because what's happening is all the light coming to that lens then bends and goes out parallel and never actually focuses down. When you're looking at, at um, through a magnifying glass and you move it further or closer and further away from you, you'll actually see the change. You'll see the change from it looking like it's bigger on the opposite side to all of a sudden it doesn't really focus. And that's because you're kind of at that sweet spot for the light. Anyway, so there you go, a converging lens. Um, you can actually get virtual images or real images depending upon the setup, all right? So it's not like just one of them will do anything in particular. So let me real quick show you an example with a divergent lens, just so that you can see that nothing is different. Um, but we'll approach this in a slightly different way, all right? So for this one, let's say that we have a divergent lens. Um, but we'll still go at the same focal length of 20 centimeters. But here's what I want to know is where should we put an object so that its image has the same orientation but is one third its size.
All right, so let's see what we know. So we've got a focal length of 20 centimeters, but it's divergent. So that means that in this case, F is negative 20 centimeters. I'm trying to find DO, right? Where should we put the object? But the other thing that I was told is I want a magnification. I want it to be one third its size, but I want it to have the same orientation. So that means that I want its M to be plus one third. All right, so let's see what we can do. So obviously, we're going to want to use the 1 over DO plus 1 over DI equals 1 over F. But in order to get DO, we need DI. Well, that's where the magnification is coming. Let's look at this thing. We know magnification is equal to negative di over do. So if I were to like cross multiply this, I get do is equal to negative three di. Or di is equal to negative one third DO. So let's substitute this up into there for DI. So we're going to get 1 over DO plus 1 over negative 1 third DO equals 1 over negative 20. So that's 1 over DO minus 3 over DO equals minus 1 over 20. And it doesn't take very long. <laughs> On this, this is a negative 2 over DO equals minus 1 over 20. Cross multiply. And you get that DO needs to be 40 centimeters. So this is another one that's going to create a real, or sorry, a virtual image. DO was 40. If we plug that back in here, if you want to see where the image is, the image is at minus 40 thirds. So it's on the same side as the object. So this is another lens that if we're looking through it, it looks like the image is on the same side as where the object was. It's just this one, it got smaller. So this isn't a magnifying lens. This is a microfine lens. Um, it's actually going to make it look small. All right, so do we want a lens to do that? Yeah, potentially. I mean, it just depends what our goal is. If our goal is to try to be able to read the dates on the coin better, no, this was off. But if we want to maybe take this bigger image and make it so that we can see all of it in a smaller area, OK, yeah, that'll do it. It's reducing it. All right. But notice that the formula doesn't change, whether it's a converging or diverging, this, that, or the other thing. It doesn't. All 
All right. Well, I see that we're pretty much out of time, and I don't want to do a two lens example right now because it's going to take way too long. So that's the hook for Tuesday. We'll make sure I get you guys back here on Tuesday. Um, we'll start with, well, what happens when we put lenses together? We'll do the math on it. And then we'll talk about the consequences of that with things like microscopes and telescopes and, and all the other sorts of things that involve lenses. We'll talk about the eye, how corrective lenses work, and um, kind of give you some context to this, some real world application before we start getting into interference. Um, but uh, get ready, interference is fun. All kinds of cool things that we see because of interference. So um, I believe that we haven't quite gone, quite gone over everything yet for the chapter two homework. So I'm gonna extend that due date from Tuesday to Thursday. So I'm gonna buy you a couple more days for this uh, chapter two homework. Um, and I will try to remember to change that in the next day or so. If I don't change it by Tuesday, remind me that I haven't done it because you know me, absent mind is brief. All right, so um, I think with that, we'll go ahead and call it a day. And I'm gonna wish you guys all a wonderful weekend, except I know I'm gonna see you all tomorrow in the gym. All right, so see you when I see you.